I mean, you've got an amazing pedigree to discuss all this. You've got a PhD in the philosophy of science from Cambridge. You're a former geophysicist. You now direct the Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture in Seattle. You've had New York Times bestsellers, Signature in the Cell, Darwin's Doubt, Return of the God Hypothesis. And you've been on all the biggest uh, podcasts in the world, Joe Rogan, Ben Shapiro. And now I'm glad to say uh, uncensored. This all blew up last week because Tucker Carlson went on Joe Rogan. And I don't know if you saw this, but he said this about this very issue. Take a look. If evolution is real, and if there is this is constant... I don't know. But it's, it's, it's visible. Like, you can measure it in certain animals. You, you can measure you, adaptation. Yeah. But there's no evidence that... Evol in fact, I think we've kind of given up on the idea of evolution. The theory of evolution as articulated by Darwin is, like, kind of not true. Right? In, what, in what sense? Well, in the most basic sense, the idea that, you know, all life emerged from a single cell organism and over time, and there would be a fossil record of that, and there's not. Your response? Well, uh, I don't know what Tucker knows about all this, but... Uh, <laughs> Probably not as qualified as you, but he's, he's a, he, you know, he likes to... Maybe we start with something that happened here in London a few years ago, 2016, a major conference convened by the Royal Society, arguably the world's most august and prestigious scientific body, was convened by a group of evolutionary biologists who uh, are dissatisfied with the standard neo-Darwinian theory of evolution. And many of the, the conveners are calling for a new theory because the primary mechanism of biological change articulated by Darwin and his subsequent followers now called the neo-Darwinists, the idea of natural selection acting on random mutations and variations, is now understood to lack the creative power to generate major changes in the history of life. And is, is the, the, at the crux of this debate, is it, as Tucker was getting at there, is it that if you actually start from where Darwin's theory begins, the creation of the human being was so complicated, the body, the way we exist is so complicated, it doesn't make any rational sense. There's two issues, really. There's how do you get to the first life from the simpler non-living chemicals. That's sometimes called chemical evolutionary right. theory. And that's a complete mess. It's in, it's in a state of impasse. And almost everyone, even your recent guest, uh, Richard Dawkins, yeah. acknowledges we have no chemical evolutionary theory that accounts for the origin of the first life. And many people don't know that Darwin didn't attempt to explain the origin of the first life. Rather, it, he presumed one or very few simple organisms, which we now know are not, were not simple, mm. and then proposed a mechanism by which you could generate all the new forms of life we see on the planet today. I mean, but even that now is being challenged because the main mechanism of evolutionary change does a nice job of explaining small-scale variation, mm. what Tucker was referring to, I think, as adaptation. Mm. This would be examples like Darwin's finches, where the beaks get a little bigger, a little mm. smaller in response to varying weather patterns. But it does a very poor job of explaining the major innovations in the history of life, such as the origin of birds or mammals or animals in the first place. And there in the fossil record, we do see very abrupt, many uh, uh, instances of very abrupt appearance without the trans transitional intermediates that you'd expect on the basis of the Darwinian picture of the, the tree of life. So is your belief that the Darwin theory actually fails then? I think it does fail. Uh, I think it, it captures an element of the truth. It, it, there's a, the, the small scale microevolutionary variation is certainly a real process and no one uh, disputes that. Natural selection is a real process, but what's, it, what's it at issue now is the degree to which it has genuine creative power. And I think at this 2016 conference, the opening talk was given by a prominent Austrian evolutionary biologist, not an American talk show host. And uh, uh, he enumerated five major explanatory deficits of neo-Darwinism, many of them surrounding this problem of the mechanism lacks the, the generative or creative power necessary to account for the major innovations in the history of life. Well, your best-selling book, uh, new book, Return of the God Hypothesis, you argue there are three big scientific discoveries that point to the existence of God. And I want to go through these. One, the Big Bang Theory. So why would that lend support to a theory of a God or God? Well, right, Let, maybe just a little framing uh, before I dive into the evidence. Um, uh, Professor Dawkins at Oxford yeah. has said that the universe has precisely the properties that we should expect if at bottom there is no purpose, no design, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. And though I'm on the opposite side of this science mm. v. God issue with, with the good professor, 
I think he does a marvelous job of framing key issues. And this is one of those great framing quotations. Because what he's saying is that, that whether we think of it as a scientific question or a philosophical question or both, if we have a hypothesis about reality, the way we test that is by looking at the world around us and seeing if what we see comports with what we would expect to see if our hypothesis were true. Mm. And his hypothesis is that of blind, pitiless indifference, which is a, a, a shorthand way of saying that everything came about by strictly undirected material processes. And what the materialists expected coming into the early 20th century was evidence of an eternal self-existent universe, mm -hmm. one that had been here for an infinitely long time and therefore did not need an external creator. What in fact the astrophysicists, the cosmologists, the astronomers found was evidence of a universe that had a definite beginning and therefore one that could not have created itself because before the matter of the universe came into existence, there was no matter there to do the causing. And so the, the picture of the universe that has emerged starting from the 1920s all the way to the present, both from observational astronomy and from theoretical physics, is a universe that had a definite beginning and therefore requires some sort of external creator or cause. Dawkins is obviously one of the world's most famous atheists. Are you a, a believer in God yourself? I do believe in God, yes. Okay, so let's yep. play a clip from Dawkins on this show. Yes. So why is it not possible that there is a superior being, power, which many people believe in, in different it's ways? It's possible different, there are fairies at the bottom God. of the garden. I mean, all sorts of things are possible. <laughs> and you, you, you can't deny that. Well, except I've never seen fairies in the garden, have you? No, you've never seen God either. No, but you don't know for sure that either doesn't exist. No, I don't know that fairies don't exist. Fairies may well, there may be leprechauns, <laughs> for all I know. You know, my big question for all atheists, well, is, OK, you don't believe in God, but what was there before the Big Bang, before this all started? What was, in other words, what was there before supposedly nothing? What is nothing? Nothing, to me, seems to be a totally incongruous word. What is nothingness? And if you can't explain it, to me, and I believe in God, but to me, it suggests there must be a, a power bigger than the human mind at the start of all this that was able to comprehend what may have happened, because we can't. Right. Uh, Dawkins wants to portray theistic belief as if it's uh, equivalent to belief in fairies. Mm. And, uh, and he'll concede that, well, it's possible. But I think there's a stronger argument for the, the, the theistic case. Mm. And that is that when scientists and philosophers reason from evidence, they typically use a method of reasoning that has a technical name is called inferring to the best explanation, where the best explanation is one th where you're invoking a cause which has the kind of powers that would be required to explain th the phenomenon of interest. Mm. And you correctly pointed out in your conversation with him when, that when you get back to that, what physicists mm. often, call, often call the singularity, mm. the point where matter, space, time, and energy begin to exist, the materialist is really up against a, a huge conundrum because prior to the origin of matter, there is no matter to do the causing. That's mm. what we mean by the origin mm. of matter, that that's where it starts. Right. And so if you want to invoke a cause which is sufficient to explain the origin of matter, you can't invoke matter. It's in principle, the materialistic explanations yes. are in principle insufficient. So you need to invoke something which is external to the material universe mm. and is not bounded by time and space as well. And that starts to paint a picture of the kind of cause you would need that has the, the sort of attributes that traditional theists have uh, tr traditionally associated with God. God is a, a timeless, uh, God is outside of time and space, has causal powers, is, is an agent with volition, and therefore can initiate a change of state from, in this case, nothing to something. And do you believe that God uh, created this original single cell that, from which everything flows to us? Oh, the single cell as opposed to the universe? Well, I guess yeah. you, go, you go back to the universe yeah. uh, uh, and then you go back to the creation of a single cell that has this incredible complexity that eventually, through the process of evolution, leads to human beings. Yeah, I, but I do think there's... Do you believe that's really I, I do the think, most likely scenario? Yeah, I do think there's incredible evidence of intelligent design at the point of the origin of life because that first simple cell... Um, in the 19th century, Thomas Huxley said that the cell is a simple homogenous globule of undifferentiated protoplasm. <laughs> And Brilliant phrase. I, I, wonderful. He was one of the great scientists of the 19th century, but we know so much more now that he didn't know. And that what we now know that is that inside even the simplest cell, we have digital nanotechnology. Mm. We have the information stored in the DNA. We have an exquisite uh, system of information trans, uh, storage, transmission, and processing. 
and, and that information is being used to build protein machines and, uh, and other even more complex nanomachinery mm-hmm. inside the cell. So it's a sort of automated factory run by digital information. People didn't know about that in the early 19th century. But do you believe, like I said, originally there's just one single solitary cell that's created? Well, right. I, presumably, that's where... Is that what you think? I, I, I do think there was a, a, an original cell that was created. Because the theory of evolution says the journey from single cell to the full complexity of life on Earth and so on happened by random trial and error. But your position, I think, is that it's so complicated, this original single cell, so complex for all the reasons you just articulated, that that's just simply not feasible, that it would be just random trial and error. It had to be the creation of some superior entity. Right. Am I, is that right? Well, again, there's two contexts. There's the how do you get to the first cell, and then how do you get from the first cell to everything right. else. Let's just take the origin of the so first you cell. So you think the creator of the universe is God? I do. And then out of the universe comes the creation of a single cell, which again is God. Right. Um, here's the evidence, though, that when, when we see information in a, a, a digital or alphabetic or typographic form, and this is what we actually see in the DNA. Mm-hmm. When Francis Crick elucidated what he called the sequence hypothesis in the late 1950s, he realized that the four subunits along the interior of the DNA um, are functioning like alphabetic characters in a written text or, or digital characters in a section of software. What we know from experience is that whenever we say information of that sort, mm-hmm it always comes from a mind. Bill Gates, our local hero, has said that DNA is like a software program, but much more complex than any we've ever devised. Richard Dawkins has acknowledged that it functions like a machine code. Mm. Well, what we know is that software comes from a programmer. And in fact, whenever we see information of that kind, whether it's in a software program or a hieroglyphic inscription or a paragraph in a book, it always arises from a mind, not a material process. So the, the discovery of information at the foundation of life and even the simplest living cell I argue, is decisive evidence of the activity of a designing mind in the origin of life. What is the Goldilocks zone? Uh, Another of your big bedrocks of your book. Well, uh, this is something. This one way that the physicists refer to something that they call the fine-tuning of, uh, of the universe, or sometimes they talk about it, the anthropic fine-tuning. Mm. The idea is that the most fundamental parameters of physics uh, fall within very narrow ranges or tolerances outside of which we have discovered life would not be possible. Even basic chemistry would not be possible. Mm -hmm. So the force responsible for the expansion of the universe uh, called the cosmological constant is uh, fine-tuned and accepted value is to one part in 10 to the 90th power. Mm -hmm. So a smidge faster or slower in that expansion and you either get a heat death of the universe or you get a big crunch, a great black hole. In either case, life is not possible. That's just one of many parameters that fall within that kind of a sweet spot. So sometimes the the physicists do talk about uh, our living in a Goldilocks universe. Uh, Luke Barnes has written a wonderful book about the fine tuning of physicists who also did his PhD at Cambridge has written a book called The Fortunate Universe. Mm. So these types of terms are now making their way into physics because physicists did not expect that life would depend upon such an exquisitely and, and improbably uh, arranged set of, of basic parameters. But there we have it, they did, this is what they found. But again, that comes back to the idea of a designer of all this. Well, one of the, one of the scientists who first discovered these fine tuning parameters was uh, Fred Hoyle. Mm. And Hoyle was a, a pretty aggressive scientific atheist. He opposed the Big Bang and even gave the Big Bang its name, the Big Bang, as a kind of pejorative to, 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 uh, to make fun of the, the, the concept. But after he discovered some of these fine-tuning parameters, he had a shift in, in his philosophical perspective, in his worldview. And he was later quoted as saying that um, a common sense interpretation of the data, the fine-tuning data, suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics and chemistry to make life possible. And I would say I, l- I love the way the monkeys always make it into the origins <laughs> discussion, even if it's in physics. It always goes back to yeah, monkeys. Uh, always um, monkeys, either at a typewriter or something. Yeah.